Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Julia Mant and I'm the President of the Australian Society of Archivists. I would like to start by acknowledging the many traditional lands on which we stand today, both across Australia and internationally. I am on Gadigal Wongo land in the inner west of Sydney and I would like to pay my respects to First Nations people in attendance and elders past, present and emerging. We have a really wonderful panel today to discuss supporting and activating the Ta Adelaide Tandanya Declaration on Indigenous Archives. The panel will discuss areas of relevance to support and activate in an Australian context. And it also coincides with the launch of the ASA's introductory course on Indigenous record keeping and archives, which is now available online. So I'm going to introduce the panelists and then hand over to them, but I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Professor Sue McKemish has worked in the record keeping and archives field for 45 years, including at NAA and PROV, Public Records Office of Victoria, and in the past 30 years at Monash as a teacher and researcher. She is engaged in community partnership research relating to rights and records and archival autonomy. Over the past year, as Indigenous Advancement Champion in the Faculty of IT, she has worked with Monash William Cooper Institute staff and Indigenous colleagues and stakeholders across Monash and the wider community to develop their Indigenous strategy. Rose Barrowcliffe is a Butchler researcher who is under, currently undertaking a research, a higher research by a higher degree by research at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Rose's research explores the historical relationship between the archive and Indigenous peoples and is grounded on the Gari Research Archive, which is held at the USC campus. Lauren Booker is a research fellow at Jambana Research at U the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Lauren grew up on Noongar and Darug country and her ancestries include the Garigal clan through her mother and Japanese through her father. Her work has involved assisting projects with endangered language communities to digitize recorded cultural material and organize appropriate digital archives. Lauren's current research focuses on issues of archival preservation, access and transparency. Kirsten Thorpe is Senior Researcher, Cultural and Critical Archivist at Jambana Institute of Indigenous Education at Research at the University of Technology, Sydney. She's from the Waramai clan from Port Stephens and is a professional archivist who's led the development of protocols, policies and services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in libraries and archives in Australia. So the panelists will each speak briefly um, on various topics and then there'll be uh, a shared reflection uh, by the panelists and a Q&A session from about 1.45. So enjoy and thank you uh, and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Okay, so it's over to me to um, start the panel discussion. And I'd like to start by thanking Julia. I know it's coming up to her, um, the end of her presidency within the ASA. So I want to acknowledge her um, work and thank her for introducing the session today. And thank you for joining us wherever you are. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people uh, here in Sydney. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and also extend that acknowledgement to surrounding lands of the Darawal and Darug people. As Julia mentioned, my name is Kirsten Thorpe. Um, my family are Waramai people on my mother's side of the family from Port Stephens, New South Wales. And I would like to reiterate that I joined the panel today in my capacity as a member of the Jambana research team at UTS, but also um, as a PhD student from Monash University, um, where in my final year of studies looking at the question of Indigenous cultural safety in Australian libraries and archives. So the panel session today will focus on the question of supporting and activating the Adelaide Tandenya Declaration on Indigenous Archives. Late last year, the International Council on Archives launched the Tendenya Declaration in support of Indigenous priorities in the archives sector internationally. A theme for immediate action in the Declaration relates to building new models of public archives that both respect Indigenous knowledge systems as well as provide a space for healing and remembrance for Indigenous people in relation to the ongoing impacts of colonization. The declaration calls on archives and archivists to support a, a remodeling of traditional archival principles in order to build ethical spaces of encounter 
and recognition without dominance, judgment and enveloping authority. Today, our panel will discuss areas, areas of relevance to support and activate the declaration in an Australian context. And I guess my role today is to set the scene for the panel discussions. Um, firstly, by introducing the declaration before handing over to my colleagues, Professor Suma Kemish and Lauren Booker, followed by Rose Barracliffe, who will respond more directly to the declaration. And as Julia mentioned, following these responses, we'll come back around and share some brief comments or reflections if need be, uh, and then we'll leave some time and space for questions, which I understand you can also type into um, the webinar. So to set the scene, in October 2019, the ICA held an Indigenous Matters Summit in Adelaide under the theme, Challenging and Decolonizing the Archive, See Us, Hear Us and Walk With Us. The Adelaide Decla Declaration was presented at the summit with a call for action that archives internationally acknowledge and adopt the themes of the Declaration for immediate action. The text for this immediate action is as follow, and I quote, that the ICA recognizes its responsibility to reimagine the meaning of archives as an engaging model of social memory, to embrace indigenous worldviews and methods of creating, sharing, and preserving valued knowledge, to decolonize our archival principles with indigenous methods, to open up the meaning of public archives to Indigenous interpretations is to bring new dynamics to new dynamics of spirituality, ecology, and Indigenous philosophy into European traditions of archival memory. It will also support a fair and healing remembrance of the colonial encounter. And the ICA supports the remodeling of traditional archival principles. It noted that to challenge the colonial ideologies in the archival setting is an ende endeavor of generations, like the colonial program itself. The result will be a new model of archives as an ethical space of encounter, respect, negotiation, and collaboration without the dominance or judgment of distant and enveloping authority." End quote. And the priority areas for action within the declaration related to five key areas. First, relating to Indigenous knowledge authorities. The second was in relation to property and ownership. The third, relating to recognition and identity. The fourth, research and access. And the final one, relating to self-determination. So like the ANSI-LAN protocols and the Australian Society of Archivists policy statement on archival services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the declaration gives us a framework and vision to act. In an Australian context, the declaration provides us with a new moment for transformation, a possibility to reframe archival approaches to privilege Indigenous people's worldviews, priorities and aspirations. That said, as a sector, we must ask some critical questions about how we approach the action and the work associated with the declaration. When I engage with the declaration, I move between the moment of feeling excitement and possibilities to then a feeling of immense burden and trepidation around who are the people that will have to take carriage of this work into the future. It leads me to, to ask three key questions. The first is, what kind of leadership will be required to build dialogue and support to activate the declaration? So I think deeply about whose energy will be drawn upon to drive this work and who are the people that are going to be part of the conversation to generate, generate ideas to support this potentially transformative work. The second question that I ask is, how do we center community in the declaration? For me, if the declaration is truly about self-determination, then it can't be the institution setting the priorities. I contemplate the measures we're going to have to take to lift up Indigenous voices in this process so that people can truly be heard. And my third question is, what kind of resources will this require? And I think when I pose this question, I'm not necessarily thinking about financial resources, but I'm thinking about people's resources and community resources. And I wonder whose labor will contribute to these changes. 
what kind of research and development work is needed and what kind of employment will be required to fully commit to reimagining the sector. And that final part also for me is what kind of handover or realignment of resources will need to take place to make this work happen. So the de declaration provides a moment for us to look for an agenda of vast and transformational change. However, in order to bring this change, we have to change the way we work and we have to change the way we engage in this process. For me, this means that we need to commit to an agenda of difficult dialogue and purposeful action to bring the declaration to life. Some of this for me means pulling it apart and bringing people together to critique and turn the declaration itself around on its head. A major gap for me in the declaration as it stands is a lack of focus on supporting the care and protection of archives and the management of cultural heritage on country. We can't lose sight of this work to ensure that archival pursuits are not extractive, but instead support community sustainability. This is expansive and complex work that is going to require new leadership and new methods of working. My hope is that in Australia, we can invest the time and build the relationships that are required to commit to a paradigm shift that is truly indigenous led and community driven. Without this commitment, I fear that the declaration will be more about what our collecting institutions want rather than it being focused on indigenous peoples and communities needs. So with that, thank you for listening to me. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor, Professor Suma Kemish to provide a response. Thank you, Kirsten. I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the unceded lands where we are meeting, including the peoples of the Kulin Nations where Monash operates, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to Indigenous participants in our webinar today. I will be exploring and questioning the Tandanya Declaration in the context of four Australian developments over the past 25 years. I have an initial general observation um, and that's, th that observation relates to how the Tandanya Declaration is narrower in scope than Australian government record keeping and archival policies and practice in that it relates only to records in the custody of public and state archives, not to current records in government agencies, records continuum style. To begin with those four developments, Kirsten's mentioned the ASTI Learn protocols, uh, first developed uh, and published in 1995 by the Australian Library and Information Association and last updated in 2012. And to note that when they were first developed, they were a world first and have guided practice in Australia for 25 years. And a question that I'd have in relation to the declaration is, does the Tandanya Declaration advance the ASTI Learn protocols? And if so, how, in what areas does it do that? In 2010, 50, 15 years after the launch of the protocols, the community guideline to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples 2007 was developed by the Australian um, Human Rights Commission and the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. It states that the foundation right of self-determination includes participation in all decisions that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lives and control over their lives and future, including their economic, social and cultural development. Importantly, self-determination is supported by the right of free, prior and informed consent, including the right to be consulted and participate in an honest and open process of negotiation that ensures that all parties to the negotiation are equal. The, and another important point is that the guideline states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be involved in the design, development, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of all programs, policies and legislation that affects them. And this would of course include 
in the record keeping and archival sector. In this context, in 2010, then Australian Indigenous Social Justice Commissioner Mick Gooder stated that Indigenous human rights need to be embedded in archival practice and record keeping practice by repositioning Indigenous peoples from passive disempowered subjects of the record or in Henrietta Four Miles words, captives of the archive to become active participating agents in record keeping and archiving. An observation relating to this is that there are powerful statements in the Tandania Declaration about the United Nations Declaration and about self-determination. But closely looking at it in terms of the balance of power, I guess I share some of um, Kirsten's concerns in that I see that in the declaration as it stands, the balance of power is left very, left very much in the hands of the public and state archives. And it's about bringing in indigenous um, perspectives and frameworks into that framework. A question stemming from that, which is about the uh, Tandanya Declaration itself, what or several questions, what processes were involved in developing it? Who had a voice and who didn't? How extensive was the consultation and negotiation beyond the ICA's expert group on Indigenous matters? Who is it addressed to? What is its current status? And will there be further rounds of consultation and negotiation? And I think we need clarification and transparency around those issues. Contemporaneously with the United uh, Nations Declaration and the development of the Community Guideline in Australia, Professor Lynette Russell, Director of the Monash Centre for Indigenous Studies, led the Trust and Technology Project, which was a pioneering research collaboration between Koori communities and 100 individual participants in Victoria, um, as well as the Koori Heritage Trust, the Koori Records Task Force, the Public Record Office of Victoria, the Indigenous Special Interest Group of the ASA and Monash University researchers. This research found that an extensive suite of rights in records were needed to support the exercise of human rights and self-determination. A set of principles was developed, the most relevant to the Tandanya statement being that Indigenous people have rights to make decisions about all aspects of the management of records about them in public archival institutions, including records created by governments and other non-Indigenous organisations, that they have a right to set the record straight and that these rights should be recognised in Australian legal record keeping and archival frameworks. An observation relating to this the Tandanya Declaration supports a very important set of rights in records that relate to the ownership and control of traditional knowledge and intangible cultural heritage. It supports qualified engagement in arrangement and description of other records concerning Indigenous identity in particular, collaborative descriptive representation and a degree of control over access to records concerning Indigenous people. And the question that stems from that is that given the Declaration's commitment to the UN Declaration and self-determination, should it recognise a broader suite of rights, including participation in setting frameworks and developing policies and practice for appraisal, description, disclosure and access and culturally safe record keeping? And finally, in 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the People of Australia was released, enshrining a First Nations voice in the constitution, establishing a Makarata Commission to su supervise treaty making processes and embracing truth telling about First Nations history. Conceived from collective experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, as stated in, in the um, preamble from all points of the southern sky and an unprecedented process of dialogue and consensus building. The Uluru Statement says 
our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It has never been ceded or extinguished and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty, sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. A related document is the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Communique. It's addressed to all individuals and entities involved in the creation, collection, access, and analysis, interpretation, management, dissemination, and reuse of data and data infrastructure in Australia. Data, Indigenous data, is information or knowledge in any format or medium which is about and may affect Indigenous peoples both collectively and individually. Note, this would be inclusive of records and archives. Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of Indigenous peoples to exercise ownership over that data. And go governance refers to their right to autonomously decide what, how and why Indigenous data are collected, accessed and used. And my obs final observation, the Tandanya Declaration does not speak to Indigenous sovereignty. There is a brief reference relating to advocacy for Indigenous data sovereignty to be included in record keeping legislation. So my final question is, is in this momentous time, given the deep history of ancient sovereignty in this continent, how relevant is the Tandanya Declaration to the structural reform of Australia's public record keeping and archival sector to support Indigenous sovereignty in the spirit of the Uluru Statement. And now I'm going to hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Sue. Uh, hi, everyone. I'd just like to first uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Gadigal Wongal country where salt water meets fresh water and pay my respects to Gadigal Wongal elders past and present. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Indigenous people and First Nations people that are tuning into this webinar um, and also acknowledge the work um, of the Expert Matters Indigenous group who uh, put the work in for the, the declaration. So I'm Lauren, I am Garigal clan through my mother's family and through my father's family. Um, uh, they come from Nagasaki in Japan. Um, I'm a, as Julia mentioned, I'm a research fellow at John Bunner Research. I work with Kirsten and I'm also a HDR student at, um, at UTS. Um, so when I was thinking about what to address in this webinar, I kind of, I wondered what I could bring to this panel, which is a, a panel of legends in the field. Um, and I've been sitting with the Tandanya Adelaide Declaration um, this week alongside my current PhD research, which is always there. Um, and I'm thinking back to that last day at the ICA conference on Ghana country, surrounded by other indigenous people working with and in the archives sector. Um, and what strikes me about that memory is the diversity of experience um, within, that arc within the archive sector across um, these colleagues of mine that I listened to and sat next to. And, I think the connecting force across those experiences were, uh, were really, it was really commitment and fire. So this is working past 5 p.m. for their stories, their ancestors and lands uh, without constant sector support, without policies and legislations always having their back. And in that frame for me, declarations and foundations, uh, sorry, declarations and statements are foundations that need to be formulated and maintained daily as a daily practice. So I recognize that the Adelaide Tandanya Declaration is a, is a good foundation to which we can speak back to uh, or springboard from like what we're doing today on this panel. But we also have to make the declaration that solid foundation through implementation. And I think that that's the most difficult part um, that we're all kind of speaking around as well. Um, 
because it, that takes commitment, it takes fire, uh, and it also takes accountability. So the Adelaide Tandanya Declaration's preamble, it situates the declaration as a tributary of UNDRIP. Uh, it signals a rights-based approach to the reformulation of archives and archival practice for consideration effective immediately. So for a human rights-based approach to anything, the key is implementation and accountability around implementation. So I think if we want to get anywhere near what the declaration uh, declares, we need to be actively engaging in ways of working in the archive sector that isn't so much, that aren't so much new ways, rather drastically different ways uh, to the ways in which the profession has built itself upon. And we really need accountability around that. So this can't be just another race run on the spot uh, where we call the same processes by another name and refer back to the declaration as the sector's foundation because that's what the declaration intends to be. Rather, we need to make it that foundation. So today I'm gonna briefly discuss the Adelaide Tandanya Declaration's preamble. Um, I was talking with the other with the rest of the panel members the other day about how I really like preambles. I think they have the capacity to be more expressive, more passionate. And for me, the most important thing around all of that is that they are more accessible. Um, and I find also that preambles can be volatile statements. They sometimes float around, sometimes they miss the mark or they never really land. So I wanna to speak directly to uh, where I see some issues with implementation, particularly keeping in mind that this is uh, in relation to who I am and to the research that I'm currently doing. So I definitely don't claim to be doing a scholarly breakdown of the preamble in 10 minutes, though that would be an interesting task. Um, so I encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to read the preamble of the declaration, um, because there are some really strong sentiments in there. Really strong, you know, so in the preamble, this is where we establish the imperial and colonial regimes of global expansion, that archives and archiving are both mechanisms of and for. Uh, we also situate ourselves where applicable, of course, in settler colonial states, uh, which is the case for Australia. And it's also, uh, which is also where we situate this panel that we're talking about today. Um, we also have the statement of the unreconciled nature of, relation, of the relationships between indigenous nations and settler authorities. And I think it's really important to say that we are right now in the midst of those relationships coming to light for a lot of people in Australia who either weren't aware or were choosing to push it aside. Um, and I believe Rose is gonna speak more on that after me. So I'd like to raise some tensions that I see uh, in the declaration's implementation by drawing on the inclusion of a decolonization ideal that's stated just after the preamble. And this was, this ideal was, was mentioned by, by Kirsten in the beginning as well. So in the preamble, we are in a settler colonial state. Many archival institutions and organizations are settler authorities. And this is a unreconciled relationship for many indigenous nations. And you know, that is, that's strong and that's reflected in the words of the preamble. However, I also wanna draw on a quote uh, that comes just after the preamble, opening the main body of text. And it says, to decolonize our archival principles with indigenous knowledge methods, to open the meaning of public archives to indigenous interpretations is to bring new dynamics of spirituality, ecology, and indigenous philosophy into the European traditions of archival memory. So um, from my perspective, I see tensions here regarding accumulating more indigenous knowledges, more indigenous IP, into institutional st structures that are designed to break down and assimilate that which falls outside of their framework. Archives and archiving is power. We all know that. So we have to be mindful as we go ahead, you know, if we do, um, as we go ahead into these radical spaces of change that the sector does not just continue to do that which we are critiquing. So for me, this brought up um, when Duff and Co state in their paper, uh, social justice impact, um, impact of archives, a preliminary investigation. They say, first and foremost, we place power and its distribution front and center 
as the most significant consideration for understanding social justice and injustice. We argue that archives can both produce and reproduce justice and injustice in the decisions that they make on how they shape the past and engage the present. So the power dynamics involved in reorientating the whole sector towards upholding and advocating for indigenous rights and social just justice practice need to be transparently discussed. The process may not be perfect from every perspective, but I think that engaging in active conversations like uh, the one we're doing right now um, is one way to get deeper into those nuances, the nuances of the structural blocks, um, and most importantly, the present needs and goals of the nations being supported. So this is a moment, um, as we, we all can see, this is a moment to critique and act on narratives and mechanisms of power, control and ownership. So on that note, I'm gonna go out on a limb here uh, and say that I find it really difficult um, to imagine the decolonization of Eurocentric structures in a settler colonial state. Uh, specifically, I find it really difficult to imagine the settler colonial state sanctioning the decolonization of its sanctioned institutions and organizations. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't push uh, with all of our might for that. Um, I think we should, but I think there needs to be more recognition uh, of what we're saying we will do as a sector. We are pushing against the state when we have ideals that are decolonizing in nature. You know, the gravity of that is massive. Um, it's a huge undertaking and it's an undertaking that needs um, commitment no matter what the possible blowback. And this is why I say I don't hold my breath because I've engaged with collecting institutions that I'm sure many other people on this webinar have too. I've engaged with collecting institutions that will go down with the ship to maintain status quo. I say this not to snuff out the fire, but I say it to light a bigger fire. These Settler colonial structures that we witness in the collecting institution sector, they don't end at the perimeters of our sector. Uh, a key concern for me is the siloed nature of the archive sector, the archival discipline, um, you know, because the program of imperial and colonial expansion, dispossession and supremacy, that isn't siloed. So obviously I understand that the nature of a sector declaration is going to be sector focused. It's going to be you know, siloed by nature, but um, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we, um, when we think about the declaration in practice and implementation, we then have to think cross sector. We have to advocate cross sector and not just across GLAM. Um, I feel like that is, is a bit of a given, of course, across GLAM sector, um, but also across the education sector, which is getting slammed at the moment in Australia, um, particularly across STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we talk about public state sanctioned archives. However, this isn't the only archival locale and both Kirsten and Sue have, have mentioned this as well. You know, I, in my personal work, um, in, my, in my research, I mostly have engaged with archives that sit outside of that definition or sit outside of that consideration of what is a public state sanctioned archive. So I think we need to be um, asking and formulating answers to, which I'm obviously not gonna do right now, but I'd love to be involved in that, um, to what is the interaction of international and domestic rights, legislation, institutional policies, and importantly, many nations cultural protocols, not only in the archival sector, but in adjacent disciplines and also the private sector with whom we're, we already do and we're gonna to have to keep doing, uh, we're gonna to have to collaborate, negotiate and possibly resist and push back hard on if we're gonna move forward into that rights-based approach um, and importantly, rights-based outcomes. So for me um, uh, personally and for us on this continent, I, I really think we need to turn to the incredible, fantastic work of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lawyers, Robin Quiggan and Terry Jenke, uh, you know, because if this sector really means to shake up business as usual, uh, 
and push against the state, then sure, let's let's go for that. Let's do it. But we need to do that with an informed backbone of ICIP of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights and importantly accountability for that. Um, so yeah, I think the implementation of the declaration in an Australian context um, is about supporting nations in what they want to do with their knowledge, rather than focusing on a on an influx of more Indigenous knowledges and IP to amend a settler colonial archival system, uh, which I argue is always going to be broken because it's broken by design. So yeah, that's that's it from me, and I'm going to hand over to Rose. Thanks, Lauren. Um, hi everyone, my name is Rose Barracliffe and as Julia mentioned, I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, I'm a bachelor woman and my research is, is based around an archive uh, about bachelor country. I'm coming to you today from the unceded lands of the Kabi Kabi Gabi Gabi people and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders and their community and ongoing connection to country. Um, so the designing the archive conference in Adelaide last year was my first interaction with the global cohort of archival professionals. And part of the reason I chose to attend that was that I wanted to be part of the Indigenous Matters Summit on the Friday, which launched and then workshopped the Tandanya Adelaide Declaration. I remember it as being an intensely interesting but tiring week. There was a lot of goodwill at the summit from non-Indigenous archivists who wanted to support the declaration, but there were equal amounts of frustrated Indigenous archivists in the room who didn't feel like proper consultation processes had been followed. Now, here we are almost a year later and the declaration has still not been enacted in any archive that I'm aware of. Um, my panel colleagues have already talked about some of the reasons why this is. And I actually feel like I'm the least qualified person here today to speak about how archivists and institutions can activate the Tandanya Declaration within their own institutions, because you all know your institutions better than I do. But I also feel like the subject of the panel needs to be flipped on its head. Instead of focusing on how to support and activate the Adelaide Tandanya Declaration, we should be instead discussing how the Tandanya Declaration can be used to support Indigenous agency in memory work, including that of institutional archives. And I'm sure that this is how my Indigenous archivist colleagues that worked on the Declaration intended it. The Declaration itself doesn't need to be supported or activated Indigenous peoples and communities do. So as an Indigenous user of archives, let me speak not about how to support and activate the declaration, but rather how I would hope that the declaration can be used as a tool for archivists to keep their institutions on track with anti-racist praxis. Lauren has just discussed the preamble, which brings us all to a start point of common understanding. I see the preamble as a statement of what should be a minimum standard of common understanding. I know from my own personal experience of having to repeatedly explain my family's history of racism, frontier violence and stolen generations to non-Indigenous Australians that we do not have a common understanding in this country. Our history is a colonial history and attempts to teach a more equitable history have been met with resistance at every opportunity. Just this year alone, our Prime Minister publicly stated that we didn't have slavery in Australia. In another incident, a non-Indigenous Australian journalist covering the Black Lives Matter protest in LA for a major Australian news network thanked an American Black Lives Matter protester for explaining why Black people had taken to the streets to protest police violence, because she, as a non-Indigenous Australian, believed that Australians didn't already have a good understanding of what that was like. At this point, I would like to respectfully disagree with the Tandanya Declaration that we need a more democratic social memory of colonisation. The Indigenous population and our allies in Australia is too small a group and the pro-colonial PR machine too strong to rely on something as fickle as democracy to redress the dearth of First Nations perspectives in our social memory. 
What we need is active anti-racist practice in memory institutions to correct misinformation like the two examples above. I'm encouraged by the number of people here today to listen to this panel, because that to me indicates that a good many archivists are willing to take action. And as stated before, I hope that the Tandanya Declaration can be a tool in aid of that. If for nothing else, then to hold your institutions to account. During the Black Lives Matter uprising earlier this year, it was repeatedly mentioned to me that archivists working in institutional archives feared losing their jobs if they spoke up in any way to support the protests or did anything seen as too political. The declaration states as themes for immediate action that the ICA recognizes the responsibility to reimagine the meaning of archives as an engaging model of social memory and, quote, it will also support a fair and healing remembrance of the colonial encounter, end quote. My hope is that the ICA and its member institutions and professionals recognize that they all have an active part to play in these reimaginings of social memory and fair and healing remembrance. Colonial archives, by that I mean all state and national archives, hold many of the records that can lead to a reimagining of memory and hopefully for, from that lead to healing. In saying this, I'm just one person, and this panel has three Indigenous people. The authors of the declaration are another handful of Indigenous people. We are merely giving our own opinions, and we do not speak for the First Nations of this continent or any other. If you want to know how this declaration can be used to support First Nations people in Australia, then your first step should be to take the declaration to the many and varied nations and ask them what making this declaration work would mean to them for them. The declaration is not a silver bullet and each First Nation will most likely have a different way of interpreting and valuing this document. The truest words in the declaration are that this work will be an endeavour of generations. Thank you. I'll pass over to Kirsten now. Thank you, Rose. So the panel today has really asked a lot of questions about the declaration. And we know that they're challenging questions, um, but we felt that this was an opportunity to really start to um, push this agenda um, and start to unpack the declaration and to consider what it means uh, in both a local context, in a national context, and how that feeds back internationally. Um, we're going to go around now and make some final brief comments each and then hand over, I know we've got a couple of questions here. Um, we might even answer in our final responses. So if anyone else has anything that they wanna ask, um, please feel free to pop them in. Um, do you want to go next, Sue? <laughs> okay. So just a few ideas. Um, clearly the response to the declaration needs to be indigenous led and, and non-Indigenous record keeping and archival com community members need to walk with Indigenous colleagues and work together uh, with them for uh, record keeping, archival self-determination or autonomy. A really important issue is this has to be resourced. There need to be protocols and processes to support the response. And that initially needs to rest as, as um, the panel has said, um, with taking it out to um, First Nations people in Australia. Uh, I know that one of the questions from, from Tony Leviston related to, okay, um, what actions are needed in relation to structural reform? And I've got a couple of examples. Um, how about, holistic Indigenous living archives on country supported and resourced from national and state budgets involving a redistribution of funding for the public archival sector, which most funding now goes in, into government archives, not national archives, and repatriation rights would need, be needed to support that. And the jumping off point for that is the part of the declaration, the Tandanya Declaration, that's about property and ownership. 
of Indigenous traditional knowledge extended to all records of and about Indigenous peoples. And I also look at the Banjalaka Museum model in, in, in Melbourne Museum, uh, an Aboriginal cultural centre uh, developed in partnership with Victorian Aboriginal communities, which is uniquely placed as the only living Aboriginal cultural centre within the state institution in the country. Um, so they are uh, some um, things that I think we could uh, be thinking about in terms of um, the kinds of structural reforms that might support the wishes of, uh, of our uh, First Nations people in this, this area. Thank you, Sue. Rose or Lauren? Lauren, do you want to add any final comments? Sure. Um... Yeah, so I think it was before um, your comment about yeah, funding, I mean, like that is, that's a, a key space that needs to be inquired into and diversified. Um, I, I also think back to Kirsten earlier saying, um, who's labor? Um, and that for me, yeah, really connects to who is going to be resourced to do, to, to roll out a lot of the things that this declaration um, uh, puts forth. You know, I really think about, how many uh, uh, fantastic, hardworking uh, community archives um, that I, I have visited or I know people or I've heard of uh, working in those spaces. Um, and I think that that, I, yeah, that needs to be supported um, in a tangible way, not just with words um, um, and resourced. So, I think for me going forward, looking at those, yeah, looking at the, the spaces that we've, we've kind of all um, talked about that, that are, are, are a bit missed um, in the declaration, not a bit missed, are missed in the, in the declaration, I think is a, is a definite way forward. Um, yeah. And I really also look forward to, I, I, would, I really encourage other people to have these kinds of discussions about the declaration. I think about how there hasn't been much discussion since uh, last year, and um, I really hope that this has ignited um, or added to a rolling um, a rolling conversation um, about implementation um, of the declaration, or um, and how it can be relevant uh, to local needs. I think. Thanks, Lauren. And Rose, I'll hand over to you before I make some final comments. Okay. Um, I think, Kirsten, you talked about, you know, leadership and who's going to drive the activation, who's going to, who's going to bring that into the archives. And I think I, my thought on that is that if you're not seeing that leadership, then you be the leader within your institutions and start having those conversations. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Um, and when in doubt, the answer is always speak to the community. They're the ones that need to decide. You need to give them the agency to decide how it will work for them. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Rose. I'm just looking at the questions um, and one of them from Kate is about um, what's the one thing that we can do in the next month to advance and start the journey? And I guess for me, it's actually starting to, to do this kind of questioning of how does the declaration fit into your local context? Um, you know, not only focus on the collections that you have, but look at the relationships that you need to build and I think that's a major flaw in our approach uh, in institutions in Australia is that we often wait for an exhibition or an anniversary to come up before we start to look at our um, collections and then we start to springboard from that um, to build community contact. But if we take the paradigm shift and we think about those rights in records, then we really need to have those relationships embedded in every single thing that's done. And, to make communities um, visible, but also be in the driving seat around decisions. And I think that that, again, is a gap in terms of our approaches to 
curating content online, um, making decisions about what is and isn't accessible in our collection. So um, I'm a, a big person that believes in strategy. So, you know, if I could do something in the next month, I'd start to pick apart the gaps in your institution um, and to think about um, where that work needs to be built rather than just thinking it's going to be a one-year plan, start to think in the decadal um, approach, where do we want to be in five years or 10 years? And I think one thing that's really important to me, um, having come to the, particularly the Australian archive sector at a very young age and training um, at a very young age to become a professional archivist is that we have a critical lack of um, indigenous led content in our curriculum um, that leads us into this cyclic problem of going back constantly to redress that knowledge gap in professionals about um, their competencies and the things that they should actually know as a baseline. And I know that we've had lots of questions about the, um, the uh, introductory course from the ASA and it, we very much um, saw that as an introduction. You know, there's so much other work that needs to happen. So yeah, I encourage people to get thinking um, and, and start to look at the resources that they need. And, and probably as a final kind of comment on that, um, I'm really disappointed and I often talk about the, the critical lack of support for um, Lauren acknowledged other Indigenous colleagues and I'd like to as well if um, people are listening, the critical lack of pathways and career progression for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the profession. So people are often brought in um, to do one job and then get overwhelmed with everything else that is Indigenous and it, it really is unfair and it's unjust. So. I would probably encourage people in terms of their journey to, to do what Rose has talked about and echo that leadership response that people need to, to take that themselves without um, you know, thinking that an Indigenous staff member, a sole person can facilitate all of this work. Um, we've got a couple more questions and I don't know whether our panelists um, want to jump in at all to the ones that are there. Um, James has a question about where we can find the Tendenya Declaration itself. Um, and what we're gonna do is send a link out through the ASA event page, um, which we'll do on Monday so that people can go and look at it um, and have these conversations. Uh, and another question um, about intangible heritage information. I think that um, and, and what's happening in archival institutions um, in that area. I think the Tandenio statement sort of encourages us, us to look at multiple areas of work and progress that we need to achieve. Um, so yeah, I would find it hard to comment on a Victorian instance. I think that that's something that needs to go back to local communities. And we probably have time for one more. Um, which I'm gonna throw over to other members of the panel. Julia has asked, would the panel agree um, there's been a move away from state and national institutions supporting indigenous professional experts on staff, as well as not supporting community archives archivists to lead the solutions. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in with that. Yes, Julia, I think there has been. I was going to say that there's always, yeah, there's always more work that can be done there. I think as someone that's that's been in this space for a lot less time than, than Kirsten, uh, who was actually my mentor to come into this space. So acknowledging that, um, you know, it'd be, it's kind of hard for, for me to look at that long picture as I am quite, um, I guess, quite new or green in this space. But I... Um, the little that I do know, I think that there is, uh, through my experience in the last uh, uh, couple of years, I think that, yeah, that there is a way that we can go to supporting um, up and coming Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Indigenous people into the archive space, into uh, surrounding archival traditions, uh, traditions, disciplines, sorry. Um, and, you know, I think about, uh, there has been really great examples of, um, I think of the NF NFSA, uh, I can never say it, NF, NF, 
SA, sorry, I always mix that up, um, their fantastic uh, internship that they that they ran. Um, I thought that was a, uh, which is a hands-on um, introduction, you know, and that doesn't, it, again, it doesn't get at these power structures and these deep, uh, deeper structural issues that we're, we've been talking about today, but then uh, also aside that there is this need for knowledge sharing and, and professional um, um, expertise sharing, so it's not so siloed, um, and so that uh, people can share in those skills, I think. So I think we're coming up to two o'clock. So I'd like to um, thank everyone for participating in the webinar um, and for joining us about this conversation. We definitely, I think, set some challenges for the sector in Australia and, and reiterating um, how incredible this moment is as a potential for transformation, but situating it very much in our knowing in an Australian context of the work that we've got ahead. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to more opportunities um, within the Australian Society of Archivists and beyond talking about this. And I think um, I'm really interested in the research agenda that we need around this work so that we um, inform our approaches by community-based evidence. Um, so look forward to discussing that more with people. Um, and I think James is going to share a link or a screen, or he may have already. And um, yeah, you'll receive a link, um, but thank you for joining us and thanks to the other panelists for their contribution.